Good morning. This morning I was reminded of an event that happened 11 years ago to this day in a little coffee shop up in Lakewood, Washington. Four police officers working together walked into that shop and never walked out. Just do what cops do if they have to work, you know, shift work on a Sunday morning, get together and have coffee together and plan the day. It was Sunday, November 29th, 2009. And a man walked in with a newspaper over his arm and walked up to the booth they were sitting in and murdered all four police officers. One of them, her name was Tina. And Tina's sister, Tiffany, worked in our police records division up in Spokane. So what I did is I lit a candle and it's been burned for a little bit here, a little blue candle. I'm going to sit it there and hopefully not tip it over. As a little law enforcement memorial to the Lakewood Four, as they call them, that we have not forgotten. And we love her and her sister and her sister's partners, and they will not be forgotten. So we're just going to take a moment of silence to remember the Lakewood Four. The Father, I lift up uh, Tiffany and uh, Tina's other family members and the family members of the other Lakewood Four. And today is a, a harsh and stark reminder for them, and I just ask you to just pour your love upon them. Let them know they are not forgotten. Their sacrifice was not in vain. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're up to John chapter 21. We're going to finish off John well, probably next week. It kind of depends on how long this takes. John chapter 21, the, the first half of that is hopefully a stark reminder that we should pray before we make major decisions. We should pray before we make minor decisions too. Because in here we're going to see where the disciples, they don't really know what to do. Jesus is crucified. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus has appeared to them several times. But they're not exactly sure what to do with themselves. What do we do with uh, this knowledge of this resurrection? Because they've, up to this point, they've been afraid, really, to uh, come outside their homes and proclaim the good news of Jesus. They're not sure what to do with it. They're not yet filled with the Holy Spirit, so they don't have that the boldness of God. They're just going to go back and, and go back to what they're used to for a little while, what they did before. And for several of them, they were, commer they were commercial fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. It's what they did. They fished for a living. Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, and others, that's what they did. And since they didn't know what to do, they went to what they knew how to do, right? They're going to go back. So let's take a look at uh, John chapter 21, the first 14 verses. Okay? After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. So after his crucifixion, resurrection, and after his appearing to the disciples over a period of, of days, this is what happens. Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin. Remember the same Thomas says, I won't believe unless I touch him, right? Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. And two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter, Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. He didn't know what to do. He's like, I'm going to go back to what I do, which is fishing. So he goes back to his boat and his net. They said to him, we're going with you also. They didn't know what to do. Here they have this, this wonderful thing, and they're going to go back to what they knew. They didn't stop to pray about it. They didn't think to do that, right? That wasn't, that wasn't part of them yet. So they went out immediately and got into the boat. 
And that night they caught nothing. Okay, who, where's my fishermen in here? I know we've got some. One of my fishermen is, is traveling today. Who, where's, my, where's people who are fished? Come on, raise your hand if you've ever fished. Have you ever gone out and fished and caught nothing? Yeah, well, if you go hunting with me, you'll shoot nothing, okay? So it's kind of the same thing, right? Now, I like fishing when we're catching. That's exciting. But when I'm just sitting in the boat, or puffing around in the boat, or sitting on the shore, or standing in the river, and there's nothing happening, I hate fishing. Okay? I want to catch. They should call it a catching license. So they, they fished all night, and that's how they fished then. Because in the Sea of Galilee, in the daytime, it would get hot. And we all know that when the, the sun strikes the water, when Polina Lake gets hot, or when East Lake gets hot, the fishing dies off, right? Or probably near the lake around here. You want to you catch the coconut there, you got to do it early or late. That's the best time. So they fished at night. I'm guessing maybe they hung a lantern over the edge of their boat. You know, they didn't have fishing regulations back then, right? So they're out all night, they catch nothing. And we're going to see also in here, I forgot to mention this, Jesus has a sense of humor. And I think sometimes he teases us a little bit. He's got a sense of humor here. Okay, we're going to see that. And I like his sense of humor because I identify with it. Verse 4, But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now how could they not know it was Jesus? Well, have you ever been on a boat at sun, you know, at sunrise or at dawn, and you got somebody that's 100 or 200 yards away on the shore, and they're, you know, they got their hoodie on? Can you really tell who it is? No, it might be a little foggy. Okay, you're out there on the water. Things look a little different. You can't tell who necessarily was standing on the shore. So there's Jesus on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them. Children, have you any food? Or have you any meat? Or have you caught any fish? Right? We do the same thing on the docks, right? Or on the water. We're passing by some other fishermen, right? We're like, hey, you doing any good? You know, or, yeah, you know. Right? We do the same things, don't we? So Jesus does the same thing, I'm sure. He knows they don't have any fish, right? Does he have to ask this question? No. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get a response out of them. And I think in a little bit it's kind of poking fun at him. Just a little. I think so. Right? Hey, did you catch anything? Right? And they answered him, no. <laughs> That's all John records is one word, one answer. Not that, no, it's been really slow or anything like, no. <laughs> right? It's kind of like if you pull up to the dock and you've had no fish, right? You've been out fishing for hours and hours and hours and you've got nothing. And the person in the boat on the other side of the dock pulls out the stringer, yeah. right? And just like, yeah, I'm just shutting. <laughs> yeah, they're the same way. No. And he says to them, verse six, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now this has happened once before. This is taking place after the death and resurrection of Jesus. This has happened once before. This happens at the call of Peter and some of the other disciples. This happens at the call of those commercial fishermen. The same thing happens, only Peter reacts in a different way. We're going to look at that in a couple minutes. Okay? So this is now the second time this has happened, although there's a little different reaction. Okay? So they cast the, the net to one side because that's how they fish. They fish with nets. I know it's not legal now, but it was legal then. Remember, they're commercial fishermen. They can do this. And it's so heavy, they can't draw the net into the boat because that's what they would do. They pull the net into the boat. They couldn't pull it out. Okay? Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that happens to be John, he just calls himself that in, in the book of John. Therefore, verse 7, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. He finally find it like, oh, that's who that is standing on the shore. It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for him to remove it. So I guess he's fishing naked or in his underwear. I don't know. Okay? And plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits. That's like 100 yards. Okay? 
dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus has already got fish. At least enough for him, anyway. Now, I don't know how Jesus got the fish. He could have just made it appear on the fire. I think he waited out the water and scooped one up. Okay? And it was not unusual for them to carry the ingredients to make their own bread. All you got to do is make yourself a little fire, get some coals, put a rock on there, get the rock hot, cook it right there. That's good camping, cooking right there. Okay? So, he has a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So here's what Peter does. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And this was the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So there we go. That was fast, right? Remember, this nearly identical scenario has already occurred. It has occurred three years prior. So I want you to go to your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus is at the same lake. In Luke, it's called the Lake of Gennesaret. It's the same lake. There's always multiple names for it, right? Like, Polina Lake probably had a different name before we named it after Chief Polina. Okay. Anyhow, Jesus jumps into a couple boats, pushes himself offshore to get away from the crowd, and teaches from the boat. Okay? And verse 4 says, When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, that's Peter, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. This would have been in the daytime. That would have been illogical to the commercial fisherman who fishes at night. And something similar has already occurred. They fished all night already and didn't catch anything. Look what Peter says, verse 5. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, he does not yet call him Lord. He just looks at Jesus as a great teacher at this point. He says, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. In other words, he's kind of saying, he's saying to himself and sort of saying out loud, you don't know what you're talking about. We've already fished all night. There's no fish in this lake anymore. Have we not said that in our boats before? It's not being fish in this lake anymore. It's all fished out. <clears throat> nevertheless, this is the other half of verse 5, Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. Let's look at how Simon Peter reacts three years prior to this, this second event of the miraculous catch of fish. The first time he sees this happen, let's look at his reaction. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. I think it scared him. I think he was afraid of Jesus at this point and afraid that he was not worthy to be in his presence. That's why he says, go away from me. He doesn't want Jesus to go, ah, oh, yeah, you're a sinful guy. <laughs> Zot, right? He doesn't want Jesus to zap him. He says this in fear. Verse 9 says, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Hey, those guys were there the second time too, right? Who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. Is that fishers of men, right? The old Sunday school song, We will make you fishers of men, right? Think about it. Jesus is saying right here, I'm going to take you out of commercial fishing. And in a way, you are going to fish for men. What does a fisherman do? He tries to catch something, right? He tries to bring it in. He's saying to Peter, I'm going to turn you not into a fisher of fish, but into someone who brings men and women, people into the kingdom of God. So the picture is, it's like fishing. 
This is three years prior to the event in the end of John. It's pretty obvious when you study the Gospels and you study the interactions between Jesus and Peter and James and John and the others, that they don't quite get it right away. And that's okay. So here we are now. We're in John chapter 21. We're at the end of the book of John. Okay? We are just prior to Jesus' ascension back to heaven. And they still don't quite get it. They don't know what to do. They go back to fishing. In fact, this is the last recorded group fishing trip that the disciples take together. It doesn't mean they didn't fish after that. They just don't tell us, right? But this is the last recorded guys day and night out fishing for fish. Because shortly after that is the day of Pentecost. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, who six weeks prior was scared enough to say, I don't know who that guy is three times, right? To deny Jesus three times. The same Peter who doesn't really know what to do, so he tells his fishing companions, um, I don't know, let's go fishing. We don't know what else to do, right? Jesus gives them one last fishing trip. He gives them one last big catch of fish. 153, according to John. Because, you know, fishermen count that stuff, right? You think, how do they know? They counted it. John wrote it. He was there. You know how fishermen are. They know exactly how many fish they caught. Unless, of course, they run into the fish and wildlife officer at the boat ramp and they got too many. They're like, oh, my bad. Right. I was on a tuna trip once, several years ago, out of Westport, Washington, on a 60 some foot charter. There were 13 of us fishing. And in two days, we caught 160 tuna fish. We overwhelmed the fish hold where the ice was. It was overfilled. We had to put some of them up on the, on the deck in the trash cans on the way back. Okay, that was a lot of fish. We counted them because there were 13 of us and we all wanted our equal share, right? <laughs> so they counted 153 fish. That was a lot of fish for that little boat. That was a miraculous catch. How many, how many people in the, in the first couple chapters of Acts when Peter, Peter pe preaches that first sermon on the day of Pentecost? How many people came to believe Jesus Christ on that day? How many men did he fish and catch? A couple thousand, right? Wow. See, there's a, there's a principle here, though. Notice what they did not do. When they went fishing... There's no, there's no indication that prior to them deciding, uh, we don't know, let's go fishing, that they prayed and said, hey God, what should we, you know, what should we do with what we know? They went back to their old, their old life for a short period of time. And Jesus comes along on the shore, right? He says, cast your net over there. Again, that's the last time we knew that they fished together because after that, they fished for men until they died. There was a time in my life, in our life, <clears throat> where we did something similar. We had a certain amount of knowledge and we didn't know, or at least I didn't know, did not know what to do with it. So back in 2013, I finished my biblical studies degree. I never had any intention of going into full-time church ministry. Uh-uh. Don't throw me in that briar patch. I don't want nothing to do with it. Right? So I didn't know what to do with that education. What am I going to do with that? I'm 47 years old in 2013. I can't quite retire. So I thought. So I had the idea driving around in my tractor one day. Remember, I went back to doing what I was doing. I know I'll drive a tractor. I put around in my tractor, mowing the, you know, mowing the alfalfa at the end of the season back down, you know, close to the ground, trimming it down. And I thought, you know what? As a senior law enforcement officer who was kind of on the ragged edge of burnout, I thought, you know what we really need? in the western United States, we need a retreat center, a place where cops can go 
and be ministered to for a couple of days where we could spoil them, feed them well, share the Bible with them, take them out into nature, shut the cell phone off, shut the noise off, right? And so I didn't pray about it, not really. I just set about trying to figure out how to do it on my own. Well, the place I really wanted to do it at is a place where we, we had gone uh, for several vacations. Beautiful place in the St. Joe National Forest in North Idaho, right above the shadowy St. Joe River. You can't, there is probably not a more beautiful place on this planet than where that is and what it is. And I knew we couldn't afford it because it had been for sale for a couple million dollars. Well, that's, that's not going to happen. Not on my salary, same thing I got a bad buyer, right? So I started looking for real estate in North Idaho. I drove my wife all over the place looking at houses and property. She thought I was crazy. She was right. Okay. I had this idea. And you know what? At some point, in the midst of doing all this, in the late fall of 2013, Jesus says, hey, you find your place yet? No. <coughs> Can't afford it. I mean, I had to have figured out my hand, but, right? Can't afford it. And he says, well, why don't you cast your net instead of over here, what you're thinking, why don't you cast your net over here on the right side where Village Missions is swimming around you? My God? I want to be a, I want to be a pastor. Jesus says, cast your net over there. So we did. And here we are, seven years roughly later. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? So here we are, now we're fishers of men here in this thing. Fast forward to this year. I happen to keep track, loosely, of the now elderly people, elderly, they're my parents' age, by the way, okay? Who, who built the place on the St. Joe River that I really wanted to go to that was like $2 million and I couldn't do it, right? They had retired because they couldn't keep up with 144 acres and a 5,000 square foot log lodge with eight bedrooms and five and a half bathrooms and a horse barn and pasture and, you know, all this stuff. That's a lot of work. They couldn't keep up with it. They could never find a couple to step in and take their place. It just never worked out. It wasn't us. It wasn't meant to be us. We were calling something different, right? They couldn't find So they s donated it, basically, to a big church in North Idaho, who then used that as collateral to build a big, giant gymnasium in a ball field. Okay. So the property is set under the control of a, of a Christian financial corporation that does, like, loans for churches. Anyway. So I see on Facebook from Barbara, one of the founders of this original ranch, that has now been leased by an organization named Protectors Peak, whose goal is to provide a retreat and respite for cops and firefighters and soldiers in the exact same place where we used to go on vacation where we thought, boy, that would be a great place, but we can't afford it. Is that cool or what? So I thought I gotta get, I gotta get our chaplains group, our Central Oregon Public Safety chaplains involved in this. We gotta start sending people there when you know when the schedule opens up. We gotta get people there. I gotta let my people from Spokane know where I used to work that are still there. I gotta let them know. So I made contact with the founder of Protector Speak, who is a police chief in one of the suburbs of St. Paul, Minneapolis. You think they have seen some ugliness this year, right? So I make, I just make email contact with them, and pretty soon I'm on the phone with them. And before I know it, he's asked me to serve on their board in an advisory position. Cash on the other side of the boat, right? We see, I hadn't prayed about it the first time. We did pray about village mission, should we go? But we prayed about it the second time. 
Because this organization is really founded on prayer in God's Word. It's pretty amazing. I got to have my first Zoom meeting with the rest of the board. Some of them are retired EMTs and firefighters. And some of them are retired cops. Right? Every one of them has a different... One of them is a retired missionary who went to college with uh, Chief Nate, is what I'll call him. That was pretty neat. I was like, wow. I'll just put it down here. It's still going. I don't want to light the church on fire really bad. But you see, when we pray about it first, and when we listen to God's call on our life, He works it all out. Once Peter and James and John and the others, once they really started to listen and once they prayed about it, God worked it all out. If you go into Acts, chapter, let's do that. Let's go to Acts. That wasn't even part of my plan. Let's go to the first couple of chapters of Acts. We still got time. I got you till 12 o'clock. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my stomach's going to start growling. Okay? In the first chapter, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in the first chapter of Acts, you see Jesus promises them the Holy Spirit. He says, Go to Jerusalem. We're going to start there. All world history centers around Jerusalem anyway. It does not center around the United States and the presidential election. World history, God's plan, centers around what happens in Israel. And it starts there. So he started Christianity there. He started the way, the movement there. He says, go to Jerusalem. You're going to start from there. You're going to be my witnesses. This is verse 8. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then Jesus ascends back to heaven. So they're left alone. And the angels tell him, hey, don't stand here staring in the sky. This same Jesus is going to come back someday. So go do what you got to do. Be obedient. So they're obedient. What do they do? They go back to Jerusalem. Verse 12. And what do they do? They pray. Verse 14 says, they, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They stayed where they were supposed to stay for a time. And instead of going, well, I'm not sure what to do. Jesus just left. Let's go fishing. It's not what they do. They pray. And then they replaced Judas Iscariot with Matthias, Right? They hang around. They stay together. And on verse, chapter 2 says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I think they were still praying, right? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. The Holy Spirit, verse 4 says. And the crowd outside the house hears the people inside the house speaking in tongues. He hears them speaking in their language. The day of Pentecost was a big deal. There's people from all over the Roman Empire, Jews and proselytes coming to celebrate the day of Pentecost, and they hear it in their language. From people who don't know their language. That's the Holy Spirit. And Peter preaches the second greatest sermon in the Bible. First greatest sermon, I think, is Jesus. Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew. Peter's pretty close, but, you know, we're not that good, right? Peter preaches this sermon. And adds tremendously to their number. He goes from a fisher of fish, from a commercial fisherman, over time... As Jesus prepares him and educates him over three years, Peter basically goes to Bible school with Jesus, doesn't he? Peter gets contenders' discipleship initiative plus. Because he's getting it directly from the man, God, Jesus. And over that three year period of time, Peter and the others are prepared, they're trained, they're educated. And when they begin to pray together, God comes in and does mighty things. 
Remember, they had been scared. They were afraid of the Jews. They wouldn't, they wouldn't go out and speak publicly. Right? They were afraid. But when they began to pray, Jesus filled them with His Spirit, and in boldness, the church began 2,000 years ago. Verse 46 of Acts chapter 2 says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Hey, they weren't hiding in the house anymore. They went to the temple. The Jewish temple. Where the same Sanhedrin, the ones that demanded that Pilate crucify Jesus Christ, the same people are there working, generally, working at the temple. They don't hide in their houses anymore. They go to the temple. Right? They don't go to the temple and call the Sanhedrin names. Hmm? They don't go to the temple and throw rotten tomatoes at the Sanhedrin when they walk by. They don't go to the temple, temple and deface this, the, you know, the, the temple furnishings. They don't riot. They go to the temple and preach the good news of what they're doing. And I think they're praying. It doesn't say that specifically, but I can imagine. So they continued daily with one accord. They were united break in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. So they were sharing food with each other. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Nothing complicated. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. There's a time in our country right now. Right now is a time ripe for revival, isn't it? But revival begins within the individual, within the heart. And revival might take a different form than we think of. We think of revival as, you know, the Great Awakening, yeah, you know, in the history of the United States, right? You know, big tent meetings and all this stuff. And that may not be how it takes place. I've seen this coming. I heard it from Chief, Nate, Chief Nate's mouth, and I heard it on a podcast I listened to yesterday. It was recorded a couple months ago by a, a retired a cop who's now an evangelist and writes you know, like devotionals for law enforcement and stuff like that. His name is Adam Davis. And he says, right now is a ripe time for revival of Christianity in our public servants, in our cops. Because, you know, after 9-11, everybody loved the military all of a sudden. And a lot of people were very respectful of law enforcement, even bad guys. I'm here to tell you, we're very respectful of law enforcement right after 9-11. That was only 19 years ago. Okay? 11 years ago, when the Lakewood Four were murdered in their coffee shop, the nation mourned. There was outpourings of support from all over the world. If that had happened today, if, if the Lakewood Four were murdered today, I wonder what the outpouring would be. For many, it would not be outpouring of yay. Your law enforcement officers and your agencies are ripe for revival, for Christian revival. And if you have to have someone come to your door because something bad has happened, who would you like? Do you want a deputy? That he or she is right with God? Do you want a deputy that's filled with the Holy Spirit who comes to you to provide comfort for you if a loved one dies in your home or is there to help you if something if somebody breaks in, right? Do you want a Christian to pull you over and write you a ticket versus someone who hates God to pull you over and write you a ticket? Right? As your public servants. The time is ripe in law enforcement for a great revival. We're beginning to see it. They're asking, where can we go? Where can we go to be refreshed and revived? Can they come into this church and feel welcome? 
Or are you that person that's going to ask them a stupid, asinine question? Because it happens. It happened to me over and over again. I know what's happened to my dad and anybody else that's been in law enforcement. You've always got that one person. Right? Why would we do that? That's why you don't see a lot of law enforcement going into church. A, there are, some of them are afraid they might see somebody they just arrested last week. So they got to sit at the back. Right? But more often it's for that obnoxious question. Well, I know you get a ticket for this. Just shut up and take it. Go to court and try to get your fine reduced or throw it if you have to. Just shut up. Stop whining. We need the vast majority of cops to be Christians who will do what is right when it's not popular. That's hard to do when your paycheck is on the line, isn't it? And I'm here to tell you, when the boss threatens you with your job, if you don't do what you're told instead of doing what is right, it's awful hard to say no, isn't it? When you've got to feed your wife and kids. But we need the law enforcement in this country to be on their knees in prayer every day. We need to be praying for them. We, those of us who have experienced that job, have never seen a time like this. I know the 60s were rough, right? But here's how, here's how things have gotten in law enforcement around this country. In 2019, um, I can't quote you the exact figure, there was a hundred-ish some law enforcement officers in the United States murdered in the line of duty whether they were ran over, shot, stabbed, whatever. There were over 200 in the United States. Last year in 2019, over 200 cops in the United States committed suicide. Obviously, they are, many of them, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually broken because they're all tied together. We need to be praying for them. We need to pray for revival in our sheriff's office and in Sun River PD and in Bend PD and in Portland PD and Seattle and Chicago and Minneapolis, St. Paul and every other city and county in this country. Will you join me in prayer for that? Will you join me in prayer support and financial support if you're led to for Protectors Peak over in Idaho? They held their first retreat about eight weeks ago. They hadn't had time to fix everything in the lodge because you know when things sit, they kind of deteriorate, right? They hadn't had time to fix everything. The big giant six burner gas range didn't want to work for a while because they've been sitting for a long time probably full of bugs you know what happens to gas ranges they sit they don't work okay they cooked in crock pots for about a day they had 11 cops from around the united states i've seen i've seen uh, where they came from from all over the united states that went there for two days and i got to read the evaluations i'm here to tell you cops do not like to write evaluations it's bad enough they have to write reports every day, right? Nobody wants to write an evaluation. So if you do a training, right, and you have to write out a written evaluation, it was either like, it was great or it stunk, right? Or maybe worse language than that. Every one of those evals, somebody said, this was the best weekend I've ever had. I never knew how to pray. I never knew how to study the Bible. You just saved our marriage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You've given me new hope to go back to my city or county or whatever and get back in the uniform and get back in that patrol car and face whatever I got to face that day. They need it. They need it now more than ever. They need us to be on their side 
We don't have to agree with everything they do. We don't agree with everything cops do, because I was one. You know what? I did some things people would probably disagree with, too. In fact, half the things I did that didn't get recorded might have got me fired today. I used to have a personnel file this thick for people complaining because I was mean to them. Can you imagine that? Because I have very few filters. I'm sociopathic. I don't care about your feelings. If we can save a marriage, man, it's so worth it. If we can keep somebody from going home and pulling that duty pistol out of their holster and stick it in their own mouth, it's worth it. I know two that I personally knew from Spokane that did that. And I wish I could turn the clock back and knew what was going on in their minds and sit down with them and say, hey, let's just talk. Let's go out and go fishing. I think that's what Jesus is saying to us right here. Pray. Right? Pray. I gotta I gotta listen to my own sermon too, because you know sometimes I just don't pray, I just get angry. Pray before we act. Pray that the Spirit will move through individuals in our law enforcement agencies. And that their hearts will be changed. Pray. They'll be filled with the Spirit, which gives them the strength to do it again. To get back in there, to put the uniform on, to get back into that car, to go to that next nasty call. Pray that they will always desire to do the next right thing. Because I'm here to tell you, it's hard to do the right thing when people are calling you names and screaming and yelling at you. I just want to smash them in the nose with my elbow. It's very effective. That's how I want to react. I couldn't be on a riot line today. Ah! Not without the Holy Spirit. I can do it if I pray about it first. Let's pray for our cops. Our firefighters, because you know what? They're not getting treated real well in some places either. Their suicide rate is almost as high. It shouldn't be that way. But without the power of Jesus Christ and without the love of Christ in their, in their hearts, they have no hope. Especially if they're working in some of these bigger cities where this stupidity is going on. Without Christ, they have no hope. They need Jesus. We can help with that. Every one of us. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. and Again, I thank you for the sacrifice that many have made doing the right thing in this country and they haven't made it whole at the end of their shift. I think of those today who are hurting. Many who are burying their sorrow. Burying it in the bottle. They might be burying it in bottles of alcohol. They might be burying it in pills. We know this happens. They're burying it because they're afraid. They're afraid to show their weakness. They're afraid to be vulnerable. They're afraid to open themselves up to anyone and they're wrongfully can be afraid of you. But you are a God who has humor. You're a God who, when we have no hope, will say, just cast your net on the other side of the boat. See what I can do. You're the God of all comfort. You're the God who loves them enough that you sent your Son to die for them. A Son who would stand in their place. 
and say, I'll take the punishment for you so that you can live. I pray for revival specifically in our law enforcement and our firefighter agencies. It's been a rough year for both of them in many parts of this country. May they sense and feel your love and may it flow through us. May we engage our public servants in a way that has never been seen before. In a way that brings them hope. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to ask the front music team if they will return we're going to sing a song what are we singing joy to the world joy to the world we can have joy today joy in jesus christ let's let's sing it with joy there is joy to the world because the lord has come and he's going to come again <laughs>